Who knows what Jay-Z, J.K. Rowling, Bill Gates and Oprah Winfrey all have in common? Okay, I will tell you then. They have all overcome failure in one shape or form to go on to gain success in their respective careers. Welcome to My Perfect Failure. Join us as we delve into the world of our perfect failures. We will interview, explore, and discuss how our perfect failures can lead us to success. Join us and tune in. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of My Perfect Failure. Today, we have a very, very special guest. So my guest today is a chartered business and consumer psychologist and CEO of We Are IB, an award-winning psychology and behavioral strategy consultancy. He's also an author and regularly presents at domestic and international conferences on employing psychology and behavioral science to help brands develop a stronger employee consumer understanding and brand relevance, helping brands and companies to increase their customer loyalty, retention and trust, and much more. He has spoken at international organization conferences and inspirational keynotes to the likes of Aviva, Facebook, Kaspersky, Microsoft, NHS, GSA, GSK, as well as global conferences in FS, travel, retail, fintech, health, and entertainment. Wow, that's a lot of I'm not sure anyone's still awake, Paul. <laughs> I, I it doesn't roll off the tongue, like, really, does it? It's kind of like, you know, my name's Bob and I'm a dentist. That's it, like, it, really. well, it's your fault for doing so much. <laughs> I've had to condense this, by the way. Um, he enjoys inspiring, challenging audiences into new ways of thinking and uses everyday examples and interaction to engage and educate. So a very, very, very warm welcome to my perfect failure, Dr. Simon Moore. How are you? Thank you, Paul. I'm very good. Thank you. Yeah, I for, I've probably forgotten most of that more than I remember it. Probably. Why well, to so, condense uh, that? I've, I've been working this morning to condense it. So there's a whole raft of it. I just thought, you know, that can't go in. I'll put that in the main show notes so people well, can. Well, when we talked a little while ago, it's funny. I'm mean, gonna probably get into this a little bit. I was kind of I, I keep remember. I mean, I'm getting old now and forget. I've probably forgotten more than I remember. But I, you know, just chatting to you, I was thinking, oh yeah, I did that as well. I did that. So yeah, I've been very lucky in the fact that um. Well, as we hopefully will see, I've kind of managed to chop and change and, uh, you know, lost lost this probably in the process. <laughs> but, you know, it seems to be the theme, doesn't it? I'm kind of keeping you company on this one today. Well, is, is that please? So I think that's the only reason I've got invited, probably, is to kind of, uh, yeah, join the well, club. I think this has been in the in the pipeline for, for, for a long time. And uh, for people listening, they probably sense there's some familiarity here. So we are IB, wonderful behavioural psychology consultancy simon ceo of and does fabulous work for the for the team and i'm part of that team and we go and we speak to lots of brands uk based internationally have lots of fun and i i kind of always wanted simon to come on the podcast but you don't always know how to approach people (laughs) how do you approach psychology yeah with fear most people yeah exactly so so yeah so well, that's interesting because I mean yeah. when you say that and we do we do go to I mean we've just been talking about a conference that we might go to I what well, so you um, I don't know if you get this feedback but you are very good at engaging and interact you literally just walk up to people and start talking to them and I'm kind of like despite what you just said about me and we we can talk about this in a bit more detail may, maybe I quite find that is quite difficult mm. I still actually you know find that awkward mm. even though I'm a psychologist isn't that weird yeah but That's then again this is probably what we might discuss so you know who am I and who do I project to be is yeah. uh, possibly two different yeah. things That's in terms fascinating, of that. really fascinating, aren't we? the human being is fascinating that the way that we work the way that we don't work because we're all yeah <laughs> and most people were like you know you had covid and they were like oh you know we're not interacting I was pretty happy in my shed in the garden I must admit, so. <laughs> And probably a lot of people were happier that I was in the shed in the garden out of their way, probably. So, uh, so yeah. So we've all got, our, all got our qualities, uh, mm-hmm. you know, and I, and I watch you off. Just You just sort of literally go in. And I, I've sort of seen you not even sit down and, and I look around and go, oh, there you go. Paul's talking to someone mm. already. Well, it's, it, I, think, I think people are amazing. And I think that we're, the more that we communicate, the more that we learn. Some, some things are good things that we learn, but even the bad things that we learn are not uh, can be good because it's stuff that actually I don't need to know that anymore. That I don't need to know. I don't need to speak to that person anymore or that person is great. So you can learn a lot. 
I'm still working. You're talking to someone. I'm still working out where I'm going to sit. <laughs> so that, that's probably with my psychology. I'm probably I'm probably reading the room, going, "Well, maybe that, that night dynamics over there don't look good. I'll go and sit at this table." I'm overthinking it, probably. Yeah. What it, What interests me about people that are psychologists like you, and I know that there's different types of psychologists, but because of your education, because of your studies, and because of the research that you've done over the years, you understand human beings the complexities that we all have and it's like do you walk into a restaurant and do you psychoanalyze the situation do you have a meeting and psychoanalyze the situation just because you've got these different insights and radars that maybe i'm not aware i do it i mean i suppose the litmus test is i've still got friends so okay yeah uh i would imagine if i do it too much then i would probably be quite lonely and the people yeah. be like i'm not going out with him again he's yeah. overanalyzing me so i don't i don't well i don't feel i mean you spent time with me i don't feel i'm doing it no I, I don't i don't i don't sense that at all but it's just a curiosity that i have not being a psychologist i probably i've run it so long that i might be doing it automatically i can certainly you know i'm i would say i'm pretty empathetic so i can read people's kind of mood and when mm. you know when that kind of mood changes in the room or I can read that yeah. quite well. And I, generally speaking, my intuition about people has been pretty good. Um, but I mean, we're going to be talking about this, aren't we? I mean, I suppose one of the things that I might have is that ability to sort of adapt, I suppose. And I thought that would be the theme that I would talk yeah. about today, that sort yeah. of the idea of adaptation. Mm, well, I think that's adaptation. massive. But what I'd like to start with first is psychology. When did psychology first become visible to you or something that you thought mm, this is there's something here that maybe this could be a career this is actually quite funny because I think people think I was like really determined to do sort of psychology and um understand human behavior you know I, I had some sort of career path uh, and it didn't didn't work out that way at all. so I actually so there was two things so actually well, three things so I originally were went got through to my, when I was 17, I got through to the final round of the civil service. And I had, I don't know if you've ever known the civil service. At that point, they used to do like semicircular interviews with 18 different heads of department. And 18, you, wow. Yeah. So you'd literally have, and they would do it deliberately. And they, uh, someone over here would fire a question and you'd have to look over there and then over there. And uh, <laughs> I was, I went to join the drug in border patrol kind of department I don't know what it's called now um and uh I got through to the final and then at the very end they were like great we'd like to offer you the job and I thought oh fantastic and they said but come back in a year because you're too young <laughs> and uh I'm quite impatient uh and I was like I'm not waiting a year to go mm. back and get a job so uh I thought okay well one of the other things I quite like is history so I actually then applied to do ancient history at um university and uh well, like lots of young people probably didn't put as much effort into my studies as I probably should have done. And so I missed the kind of grading by about five points or so. So I, doubt I went to go, I was meant to go and do it at um, Kent, so uh, at, at Canterbury. So, and I missed out. So then I went into clearing, so that dreaded whole. Yeah, yeah, no clearing. And, and so I had to kind of, look through I, I guess in a way it shows I'm not lazy because I had to go look for a whole list of subjects yeah yeah so, and I got down to P so I didn't, <laughs> didn't I didn't I could have gone to accountant accountancy but obviously I'm not lazy so uh I got down to P and I saw this word psychology and thought not I kind of think I know what it is but I'm not sure so I looked it up and thought oh that's quite interesting so I just sort of ticked it down and go okay well let's see if I can really? do that so I didn't know this yeah yeah and then uh I went for a couple of interviews and ended up doing a psychology course undergraduate. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So it's quite weird because there, it, there's lots I mean, people might not know this, they might do, but there's lots of statistics and maths and lots of biology and psychology. Yeah. It's not about just sitting on couches talking to people. I know the, because I studied psychology at AS level. And I don't know if I've told you this, but I'd studied. But I didn't even do that. Really? Well, I, I, I did an AS level and then I thought, I think I did a sociology degree. Not I, Well, I did do a sociology degree, but I did it at A level as well. And because of the T, remember the T test? 
Yeah, yeah, all the maths and stuff. Yeah, so I hated the T-test. Uh, so I just well, thought, it does. It, it culls. So in yeah, the culls, first year, culls, within the culls. first six months, probably it, it culls a good 20% mm. of students mm. who want to do psychology because they can't cope with the maths and the biology. Yeah. So I, I kind of, I, I I bowed my head and thought, what? well, yeah, I, yeah, maybe I should have done. But, uh, but that's, yeah, so that's my random entry into the world of psychology. Yeah. So, so, okay, so wonderful. So that happened. And then you decided undergraduate that there was, you wanted to explore it further because you obviously didn't stop just at undergraduate. Yeah, so I, it was all, yeah, so it's quite a big change. So it was a subject I didn't know and I ended up, in a city that I didn't know anyone um so that was all a, kind of a bit out of the comfort zone but it was good good to, to kind of push me and then I got towards the end um and then another funny story so I actually applied because part of my final year studies I did animal psychology and I um I actually worked at one of the well Marwell Zoo in Hampshire okay, I worked yeah, there awesome. for a little bit um yeah. and on the basis of that I got offered a postdoctoral position in North Carolina, one of the primate kind of um, sort of units over there. And I thought, well, that'd be good. And then weirdly, uh, a university in London offered to pay, kind of create a job for me in their psychology department and pay for me to do a PhD with them. And I thought, wow. well, that's quite unusual because obviously it's quite expensive. Um, you know, having said I'd never work in London, it's the first place I ended up after my uh, famous graduate. Class. So that was it. So I, I yeah, I, I kind of wonder what I I would have done because I also applied to go and be a ranger with um, Diane Fossey. Do you remember the gorillas in the mist? And the, oh, really? The, oh, really? Yeah. yeah. So I was, I got offered a job there. So I had three options. So I could have gone studied primates in America. I could have gone to uh, the rainforest in Africa. Wow. Which I know sounds really attractive. Yeah. I probably would have died there. Probably quite quickly. <laughs> you might have still been there. No, I might still be there. Um, uh, or sort of this unusual thing of someone paying me to do some studies. And I thought, oh, well, that sounds good. So I, I should probably go with that option. And that's what I did. Okay. So you had three fantastic options. So, so you got, so you got the opportunity for the PhD and that was going to be sp sponsored. What was it about psychology but because obviously, to, to even if you're somebody sponsoring you to do a PhD, that's I never done a PhD. But I imagine that some people might still run to the hills because they would think there's a lot of work here. A PhD, the idea of a, or thinking about a PhD is quite daunting. So there must have been something about psychology that was attractive to you, that was quite curious to you. I think so. And I, I think going back to this word adaptation I think I kind of pushed myself I had that I had that perception that oh my goodness I've probably bitten off more than I can chew here but I also realized that the more I studied the psychology the more I quite liked it and enjoyed it and sort of came into my own element was you know like O levels and A levels I kind of you know like a lot of people do you just tick the boxes do the bare yeah. minimum but I actually found it quite fascinating and I kind of wanted to push myself and when I started it and worked through it I realized actually it's not a big mountain there are just sort of hills that you have to okay like base camps you kind of climb gradually so if anyone out there is listening and thinking about doing a PhD it is not a big mountain to climb you do have like base camps where you stop and take stock it's okay. not as daunting as you think well I you know okay. I, maybe I was lucky but I, I didn't find it as daunting as I so, so maybe is that a bit of psychology at play inadvertently where you were instead of having this big picture of the entirety of it, you were kind of breaking it down. Maybe, yeah, maybe I did that. I mean, it was quite a baby chunk. I did think about it a few times thinking what, what on earth am I doing and how on earth have I got here kind of thing. Mm. And it can be a little bit daunting. Yeah. But I think if you can't sort of comp compartmentalize it a little bit, you know, I don't, you know what I remember mostly from doing my PhD is just playing Doom. Playing what, sorry? Do you remember the computer game Doom? No, I don't know that. Don't know oh, that. it was like a massive game that came out, like a first-person shooter game. And so the the psychology technicians were really good with IT at that point. And okay. what they did, they actually modded the game and actually made maps of the university so that you could go into the computer labs and all join up in a massive big game. 
Uh, and sort of start fighting each other around the university, which was actually quite funny. That's the most thing I remember from my PhD, which is it's, 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 it's a wonder that anybody was able to do any stuff. I know, I don't remember. And then, you know, you have to think, oh, I've got to stop the game and get on with some work. Yeah, exactly. I've got an exam to do. So just, just want to get into the academia bit. Then I want to get into the, the career pivot, because I think that's central to what we're going to talk about today. So academic, so you PhD done, and then you decide, I, I believe that you're going to actually educate the masses, the, the young. Well, I didn't decide that. I got tricked into that, basically. Okay, okay. I didn't know this. Okay. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, so I, I had a phone call one morning. Um, and this this is quite weird for people who know me a little bit. They probably go, "What? I'm probably quite introverted." Really? Okay. So I have to really try hard to uh, engage and sort of put myself out there in, in a social capacity. I mean, mm. I, I do it, and when I get there, I enjoy it. But the thought of it is a little bit like, "Oh, okay." But anyway, I've kind of I can mask it quite well, and okay. sort of, I've learned enough skills and abilities to kind of do it. So I had a phone call one morning to say that my supervisor, who is one of the professors at the university, wasn't very well. And uh, he said, I'm actually going to, I was going to go and do a seminar today on the topic of your PhD. Uh, could you cover it? And I was like, do I have to? And he's like, yeah, yeah, you know what you're talking about. Go and do it sort of thing. Anyway, he alluded to the fact that it was a seminar. And when you say seminar, you're talking like, 15, 20 people at mm. most. Yeah. So he gave me the room number and he told me, you know, you've only got to chat to them for an hour, get a few slides ready. You'll be fine. And uh, I kind of went off uh, sort of looking for this room, found the room and I thought, this can't be right. This is a lecture room. So I thought, oh, well, maybe they just couldn't get another room. So I kind of walked in, you know, and there was a few people in there. I went, I went about 10 minutes before it started, sort of loaded up the slides. And then started to fill with a little bit of anxiety and dread when the room started to fill up a little bit and then kind of pretty much realized that he tricked me and actually there was 120 students in the room and <laughs> at which point he knew i couldn't just walk out so yeah. i had to kind of get on with it really and um, actually i quite I, it was a big challenge and it i was really out of my comfort zone but i kind of quite enjoyed it at the same time that's interesting so did that I've got a few questions that, that spring to mind. So did that inform you something that actually being outside your comfort zone, there are some benefits there? Yeah, because I wouldn't have known that. I wouldn't have even contemplated doing it. And the fact that I did and thought, and the feedback actually he got a few days later was it actually was really interesting and it was kind of engaging and quite funny. I kind of thought, oh, well, maybe I'm, I'm a better editor than I thought I am. Mm. I mean, you know, and maybe it's something I should think about. And then I, I did a few more over the next few months and that kind of feeling grew a little bit. And I quite like the fact that people, it was stimulating people. They yeah. might not have agreed with me, but the fact that I was almost giving them information to think about, mm. almost not pr provocative, but it was what, you know, what I wasn't telling them this was fat. I was just saying, well, these are, this is the research is what people what do you think about it but i found that quite kind of interesting and then you ended up forging a career in that space yeah and then literally i finished with phd and then they uh offered me a lectureship and then i changed unis and worked somewhere else and then yeah before you know it i was doing sort of psychology lecturing that then turned into designing the undergraduate courses and then oh wow so i didn't them. know that okay it's designing courses as well and then i designed a couple of postgraduate ones and then i became an external examiner uh so yeah i've got you know psychology has been actually quite i've got to thank it because it's given me quite a number of experiences yeah amazing. i even ended up in cuba with psychology with cuba uh, what with castro well he was there um i so with i kept the animal psychology going a little bit so uh, i did i actually was a consultant for a while at um windsor safari park and people who don't know that because obviously not there anymore that's yeah. what lego land used to be before uh, it was okay. Lego. okay so i used to go and um kind of help them with the dolphin behavior there um weird. and then on the basis of that i got offered uh to go to cuba for a little while to work with the dolphin conservation out there so that was good 
Didn't learn any Spanish whatsoever. But. Didn't learn any Spanish. But you learned no. dolphin. Dolphin. Yeah, yeah, that's one thing about my brain. It doesn't like language really weirdly. I, I, I could get by when I'm there and then instantly forget it when I'm gone. But isn't that the thing? Because I've spoken to a few people about language and people that I know that have really adapted and learned languages, they've always done it when they've actually gone and lived in that country for yeah. a period of time. They've said when they've been in, the primarily these people are from the UK like us, and what, when they're here and they're learning it, they can even go on courses and you learn it, but the practicality of actually being there and actually using it, when initially they've gone there, it's been a struggle, but when they've, in a couple of instances, when they've been there, lived there for a period of just... I know. You kind of have to, don't you? I remember going to France once and I, I was really proud of myself. I think I, I was in a restaurant and I managed to speak three, what I thought were fairly fluent sentences in, in French. And to which the waitress just said, do you want tomato sauce with that in English? <laughs> and it kind of like, oh, what's the point then? They're going to speak to me in English sort of yeah. thing. So uh, didn't even pretend to speak French to me. Yeah. So, yeah. So just moving into this episode really is around, you've alluded to it at, at the start, around change and adaption. You, you've successfully done that from academia to, I mentioned at the start, we are, we are IB. Yeah. Even, well, even in academia, I changed. So I have been, uh, so my PhD was in um, film violence. So looking at the emotional oh, really? and psychophysical logical effects of film violence. I then went into um, the psychology of gaming. And then um, that morphed into environmental psychology, which was not very topical over here. So I, there weren't many courses. So I actually designed a course in environmental psychology over here. And then kind of ended going into the consumer business um, okay. All right, psychology really. towards the end. Okay, so I didn't, so this stuff, so what's lovely about having this conversation with you, this typically isn't a conversation that we would have on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'm No, going, we know we talk about football, don't we? I know, I know. I know. <laughs> My team got relegated this season, you're going to be incredible. So you enjoy, yeah, this, go there. Yeah, you yeah. enjoy these discussions more than me. But it's lovely to get, to capture a different side of you that I'm not privy to. So with regards to, you mentioned the different times that you've changed. Do you, if you feel curious or, or do you do you get a sense of bored, not bored, boredom's not the right word, but I can't think of the right word, but if you sense that maybe you've pushed a certain area as far as you can, do you start to wonder and think, should I maybe explore something different? I think it's, yeah, it's possibly stimulation and it's that need to kind of stimulate the brain and move on you know can i use that knowledge in another area is it similar is it different kind of thing so and i think also the the one of the things about me is i like to i do like to put myself into slightly uncomfortable situations to see what happens because otherwise i'd just be lazy and go okay, you know what i'll just stay and be safe and i think there's nothing wrong with being safe and i think a lot of people will do it but then having done what i've done i've realized that there are so many experiences and people i've met that i would never have done if i hadn't mm. put myself in that situation do, do you think being safe though that we don't I mean, potentially we compromise clearly there's going to be discomfort but you think about your growth and your continued growth that you have because you look at these you, that, you lead I'm sure maybe not some lead, people but you kind of engage these different chain journeys to you but i'm sure so there's a lot people that listening that maybe yes are feeling that discomfort of not knowing but it is it is just it is not comfortable yeah it is, you know it's slightly anxiety i'm not saying we need to be schizophrenic and jump all over the place mm. and uh you know one week you're a you know traffic warden and the next week be a train driver and then you know you might want to go to nasa or something but i think a little bit of challenge because the other thing is you your self-esteem is informed by what you do and i think a lot of people end up disabling and limiting themselves by that safety mechanism and you know and and they you, you can you can see people want to change but don't know how to do it yeah. but unfortunately what also happens is the outside world sees you and thinks oh you know not boring but you're a safe person you know so in other words i've got a new idea like in the business world 
I've got a new idea. There's an innovative new tool system. Actually, you know, Mary's quite safe. She probably doesn't need to be brought into this conversation. So you can actually end up excluding yourself. It kind of self reinforces your safe zone because you don't get the opportunity to change because people go, oh, well, Mary's safe. Let's just, she, she can stay in that corner then. Okay, so that's interesting. So for people that maybe that are suffering that, that don't want to appear safe, they're not brought into those conversations. Well, double whammy, isn't it? Because you then convince yourself that I'm I'm better off being safe, but then you don't know what you're missing. But at the same time, your colleagues are probably labelling you safe and don't give you any opportunities mm -hmm. to think about change. Is it, so is there a hack for that? So if say if you're a person that doesn't, that may be listening to what you've just said and they recognise that, actually I wasn't invited to that meeting I wasn't invited to this conversation but actually I would like to maybe be involved in that and maybe impart some of my ideas and thoughts is there yeah. anything they can do to maybe slightly shift a little well bit? I think I often and I don't know if you've been on cause and I've done it but sometimes I I am actually you know ignorant or I feign ignorance which is a little bit, um, it, it kind of puts the person you're talking to, it puts, puts them off guard a little bit because I think what a lot of people, the wrong thing to people do is when they think about change, they think I need to swap up, I need to do my homework about this new thing, I need to be an expert because once I join this new thing, I don't know anything about it, I need to know. Actually, I found the opposite works. If you go in and actually just go admit straight away, I know nothing about this, but you know what, I'm, I'm, you tell me, I'm happy to learn, but I'm really motivated to see this new thing or hear about this new thing. Suddenly you're not a threat to them either. Yeah. You've been on it. So you've taken the pressure off yourself because you've actually gone, I don't know anything about it, but Hey, I'm, I'm all ears, hmm. you know, tell me. And then you're playing to their ego because they go, Oh, right. Great. I, there's someone I can bore and educate and feel like I'm better than uh, let me tell them about it. And suddenly you become included. Uh, and that's a way of finding out whether this is something that you'd yeah. like to explore. And you, and you do do that. And that, that's, I, I think, because you're perceptive and you you can probably read the room and you know when somebody needs a little bit of a nudge to, to kind of elevate them a bit so they can really come into their own. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's not being scared to just go. I think this is the trouble with a lot of humans is we, we if you think about relationships, you think about work we always think we have to be the best at something or, mm. you know, we can't show our weaknesses or, and I think, look, that's part of being human, isn't it? Having biases, weaknesses. And I think you can turn that around to a strength sometimes and actually take the pressure off you completely by just going, I've been thinking about this. I know nothing about it, but I'm willing to learn um, and I'm willing to listen. There you go. <laughs> yeah. So, so if you feel like or most of us at some point probably feel that we were kind of placed in a box because people have a certain perception of who we are and and our capabilities and type of area of a business or a conversation that we should be involved in but we want to kind of slightly maybe break free of that box are there things that we can do to kind of start that instigate that in your opinion yeah and i think I think sometimes what, why you, you know, what, what's the purpose of you trying to break out of that box? Was it, to, is it for the other person or is it, is it for you? Mm. I'll give you an example of this. So probably if you asked most of the team and maybe you think this for as well, I'm not going to point any fingers, but mm. we see, I look at your emotional reaction <laughs> when I say this, um, but most people probably think I'm quite chaotic and uh, not focused <laughs> so I'm, I can be all over the place in conversations and you know one thing I'll say one you know I'll say I'll ask one question and then completely pivot and, and bring something else in and people go whoa what's going on here mm. actually I I do quite like order and structure but I, I but I have my own so I do it in a way that I am comfortable with and I know people perceive me as being a little bit uh edgy is the wrong word but that slightly unpredictable kind of what's he going to say, what's he going to do next kind of thing, um, which I know they think that of me. It doesn't really bother me, though, because I know that that's not quite me. And I think 
confidence has to come from your own okay. belief and your own identity first. And I think people got it the wrong way around. People want other people to like them and accept them before they then think about liking themselves. Does that make okay, sense? Okay, that's interesting. That's interesting. So, okay, so we should... You got to be comfortable with you got to be comfortable yeah. with who you want to be yeah. and where you want to be. Yeah. And if, if you want to be, I'm not. Yeah. I'm not saying that people need to be not safe. And if that's you, great and enjoy it and be be comfortable with it and be confident in it. And that's who you are. But I think a lot of people are quite mindful about their image and what mm, other people yeah, think massively. about them. That's that's interesting because in, there will be some people listening to this, to this that will work in some companies that. Or maybe even even there might be some executives that might be thinking, well, I like my team to pretty much follow my doctrine because this is the way that works for us. So it's but then when you do that, that that so that's a sure way of like completely kind of diminishing any innovation, creativity. Yeah, I feedback. agree. Yeah, I, I, I agree. But I think that does happen. Unfortunately, I think yeah, that yeah, does happen. Definitely. And that's that the person at fault is the ego of the person who's leading that team because their ego is far more important than the sort of like the actual dynamics of the team. Yeah, because Steve Jobs talks about I, I, I'm sure I heard this at the weekend, one of his famous quotes, but he talks about when he hires people, he likes them to be able to just to I don't want to manage them. I want them to go off and do their thing because that's what I brought them into the company for. They need to have that yeah, yeah. Uh, that autonomy where I know why I know why I've got them into the company into the business. Once you're here, go off. Just like when you go to the conferences. I mean, you know, possibly another person be going. What are you going to? Go, where, Paul, who are you going to speak to? What are you going to say? What What's your gist of what you're going to say? And they'll double check. Hmm. I mean, I'm you know, you're off. I'm I'm like bothered about where my coffee is. You're I'm like, oh, well, Paul's working the room. He's fine. He can he's doing his own thing. <laughs> I'm, 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 he's doing, honest, he's probably doing it far better agenda. than I am as well. <laughs> you know, it's the agenda kind of you have an agenda, but then you have a conversation. I think the wonderful thing about events and stuff and conferences, if you have a fixed agenda, then I think you close off opportunities. I think you go with a slight agenda, but then, but also being open as well, because if you're open, then other things can come into the come into the as opportunities or as new relationships can develop if right. you but then, but then you're open to that aren't you you're open to that um ability to go and do that in a room and just not be frightened about talking to people yeah. i mean I'm not saying, no, it sounds like i'm some sort of a you know robot that's been designed and a perfection i'm not at all I, I mean i've got lots of annoying qualities about me i mean one of them is i tend to i talk a lot um, for someone who's quite introverted and I've learned to do that that's just a masking behavior um, and the other thing is my brain works 10 to the dozen and if I don't say what I'm thinking I forget it because I'll move on to the next mm. thought and actually one of my friends who works in neuropsychology said I'm a classic butterfly mind it's actually a, a recognized psychology term butterfly mind Never heard. But he said, you are one of the only people who I can talk to who will hold three different topics of conversation and be able to keep going back to them and, and not lose track where you are. But that's how my mind works. And that's people, you know, and I'll interrupt people. And, it, and I know it's annoying, but if I don't do it, my train of thought would just be lost in terms of that moment. So, you know, either you're going to get what I'm going to say now and then I'll shut up. Otherwise, I might have a really good idea and you, you might never get it because I won't remember it in three minutes. Yeah. So it comes with its faults. Comes with, well, it's not all you're... like, uh, yeah, perfection. And, yeah. Uh, but you've got to, I think you've got to be brave. One of the things is you've got to be brave. And I don't mean like, you know, climbing mountains brave, but you've got to be brave in the fact that you've got to give yourself a chance. Mm. So, so. Be kind to yourself. Yeah. So just going back to academia, going wonderfully well all these different things that you tried and changed and did and then you decided I, I, I'd like to maybe shift now and maybe look at the commercial world what was that process like for you just in terms of the, the mental process the mental adjustment uh well I mean in context it wasn't just something I woke up with and thought I'd do that okay I so I I was lucky enough to do academia and teach and design courses and that but at the same time I also did some consultancy and that's I think it came from frustration for me and many people probably relate to this at this sort of growing frustration with something and get to that point where it just pops the cork and you have to do something with it and I remember thinking at one point two well two things happened for me 
One is that the ac academic world and business worlds do not go, to, they're in time, the different time zones. I mean, academic world is, you know, I've got an idea. Okay, it needs to be signed off by your line manager. Then it needs to go to the head of department. And then it needs to go to the dean. And then they sit on it for three months and it comes down. And then about six months time, you might be able to do it. And I'm thinking that's not how the real world works, is it? I don't want to do it now anyway. <laughs> well, and they moved on. So it's like... Yeah. And so having worked in the business world and know how, you know, they need decisions that day, maybe yeah. you know, tomorrow, mm. I'm getting very frustrated with that. And the other thing I, in academia is I, I just didn't like the very formulaic, stereotypical attitude about who could come and do a university degree. So, you know, it was very biased towards you have to have three A's. Really? You know, so, you, so you, okay. I used to get in all sorts of trouble with you get, you know, people don't have traditional kind of academic backgrounds, but you can see they were motivated. I mean, a, an example of group would be, and, I, and I'm being sort of, sort of throwing a big broad brush out here, but I remember, you know, single mums applying for, to come and study uh, and, and you sort of give them a chance. But then you work out really quickly that they're really motivated mm. to study. Mm. I mean, you know, all right, they've got lots of pressures on them, but they want to do well because they yeah. see this as a change themselves, that this yeah. little piece of paper is going to create something that's going to be useful for them and, you know, their children, for example. So, but, you know, offering those people places, you get yourself in all sorts of trouble in university because they'd be like, but they're not like, you haven't got three A's. Mm. And you're like, but that's such a cookie cutter approach to, so that frustrated me. And then I think, I mean, university for me just changed into getting bums on seats, money in, yeah. and then kind of like the next, you know, once they're in, okay, great, they're in, get the next lot in now. And I'm thinking yeah. that's not what university is about, really, mm. for me. So I'd say, again, I go back to having this discussion different to what we would have typically, so learning lots more uh, around, about, about you and stuff. And I, that, that, that point around single mothers and p other people that, falling in maybe not the the obvious group or, or maybe the, the preconceived group from a university's perspective or from a society's perspective to to support people that have got a more of a challenging situation that actually want to put the effort in and probably will it's, I think if you're motivated and you've got the right support it's highly likely you're going to be successful oh yeah definitely so I if think you can't be even if you've got these preconceived ideas that Mm, well, they don't really qualify because they haven't. Yeah, got... that's not to say, you know, like an 18 year old with three A levels is not motivated, but it's that shouldn't be the only. I mean, yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, merit, really. Um, yeah, so that, yeah, that's quite interesting. Um, so that was just so I think, sorry, going back to your original question, that frustration sort of grew and grew. And I was getting to the point where I was thinking, if I don't try something, it's going to be too late. Mm. So I'm just going to try it. And there was like a um, voluntary redundancy package came up. And I think they were, I mean, our department was sort of streaming people off every now and again. And you could see people were kind of like, like chickens in the coop thinking, is it my turn next? Mm. So uh, I just thought, you know what, I'll use the retirement fund and see if I can make a go of this for a year and see what happens. I've got nothing else to you know either i just sit here and wait for the chop to happen at some point or uh just kind of see if i can do something more proactive about it and, and what what i love about ib and about psychology is that that transfer of psychology and insights to the commercial world that has not exclusively but certainly in reasonable quarters that they're they don't have the insights in terms of how important psychology and behavioral science can be not just for them but more importantly for their their customer base and their audience you know there's different terms that we can use and was that something that intrigued you the idea of giving the commercial world a bit more understanding about how they can use psychology to really aid their business but more importantly their customers yeah, I definitely thought there was some, there were never people doing it, but not many. And I think uh, I sort of just realised there's a big gap there. And I mean, I you know, I used to have to bite my tongue when I was in some of these consultancy meetings about what they were doing. 
uh, because the, you know not, it's not the fault of their own. They just didn't have the understanding of how the humans make decisions, what they need to hear, communication, that kind of stuff. And so it it was it was a challenge to try. You know, it took. So when I did flip over, it took I would say a good three years before um, I worked out what to say to people really to kind of get them interested and not threatened. Because if you've been doing something, you know, if you're a marketer and you've been doing something for twenty years, mm. you might realise it's not that effective but going back to our safe word that's their world of safety isn't it doing anything different could yeah. mean could mean it could mean a great it could mean a promotion it could mean oh my goodness what a great thing you've just done but it's also a risk because it's like hang on what why are you doing something different when you've been doing it so it's, it's a self-admission that what you've been doing the last 20 years it may not have been the right thing to do yeah and that's yeah so that's interesting to me because because i think that that compound effect of doing something consistently for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, the people around us, friends, family, they expect us to do that. If we suddenly come home and say, oh, you know what, I'm actually going to leave this and do something else. They think that, we'll get, that we've gone mad. Yeah. Well, my colleagues at uni thought I'd gone, I was having a breakdown, basically. It's quite funny. There was no, yeah, I didn't get like, a, oh, good for you, kind of. I, yeah. there, I think there was some jealousy of like, oh my 100%. god, you've got the, you've got I think the that does happen. you know, you, you you're brave enough to do it. I wish I had was that brave, and it's like, well, all of you could have done it, really. Mm. But I think they did think I was like completely barking mad at the point. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's not been easy. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's been, it's quite hard. But I think what motivates me is that making that difference. I suppose. A client about a couple of years ago summed up very nicely what he thought I did. And, and he said, you literally create doors and windows in a room where they are not for us. Mm. So he said, we, we might just be thinking of one option. We could see one little window that we could look through. Mm. He said, you come in the room and now suddenly there's a big door, patio door there and there's a skylight. And he said, we've got all these options that we would have never thought yeah. about. Yeah. So that to me was yeah. quite nice hearing that. Yeah. I'm not there to go, you're doing anything wrong, or I'm just there, another tool in the toolbox, options. I'm just there to create other options that you might not have thought about in terms of the business world. Yeah. I think it's more profound than that, because mm. I think that but very often when we don't have, we go to school, we go to college, and we do all these, all the logical things, but understanding human beings, understand one another, we don't, I don't think we we really do a good job of that through the system we're not taught in my opinion through yeah life how to really understand people i think and also in the business world people think everyone just want numbers and facts yeah. and figures yeah, and, absolutely. and what we know and you, you know and you yeah. you've got with us long enough now to know that we bang on so much about that's not quite true originally mm. in terms of how the human brain works it likes to feel stuff more than it does to think about a number so that that's why i think it's it's really important because understanding people human beings ignoring biases and really and really delving into what really motivates people and understanding people that i think is is unique and it's a real opportunity and it's opening people's eyes to that that if you if you're going to stop so anybody listening if you've got a business or you're starting a business i think the holy grail is when you really understand your customer base you understand your consumer base you understand really how to engage engage them and support them because yeah I think that, that can and I, would, I would say two things are really important to me in that if, any advice i could give would be how can you position yourself in a non-threatening way that complements what they do rather mm -hmm. than going not, not you're going to go and say you're doing it wrong, you need to do it this way, but how can you ease yourself in to make yourself an asset rather than a threat? And then the other thing, I, I was given a really good piece of advice and they said, and, and luckily it was before I actually stopped the union, they said, before you switch, just do six months of networking, finding out what your audience is, who okay. are your audience, mm. how receptive is it, how you need to position it. Don't do that as you switch because yeah. you need an, a lot of time to make that new network mm, yeah so for me that was really useful make doing all that networking before i actually did the active switch so okay and so the fact that you were, you were were prepared to do that did you feel uncomfortable having to do to do different things that you typically you'd have done before because there would be some people 
that I think that maybe listening to this now that will be thinking I'm thinking about a, a career change or a, a different type of pivot invariably you're going to have to do things that you haven't done before in order to make that pivot or certainly to do the research will they have to confront resistance uh, more importantly they have to fight the urge of doing it perfectly before they do okay. it so mm -hmm. And I'll use my son as a really good example here. So my youngest, uh, as you know, plays football mm. and he is constantly told, we don't care if you make mistakes. Uh, it's all about learning. Okay. So if you make a mistake, you'll learn. If you don't make any mistakes and try and do things perfectly, you will never learn. So don't worry about, you might be doing things a little bit rough, not quite right. You learn as you go and then, the, the feedback you're getting is a really good learning experience of like, oh, right, okay, that kind of works better. So don't get yourself all wrapped up in having to write the perfect email or <laughs> website when you yeah. start. It's, it's quite organic. I mean, life's organic. I'm still learning stuff. I'm learning stuff from my team. You know, I mm -hmm. learn stuff from people all the time. It's, it's, it's just organic. No one's ever going to be perfect. Yeah, I, I totally concur with that. I think perfection is the enemy of getting things done and yeah because you worry so much about getting things wrong mm. that you disable yourself about what you might be getting right and it yeah yeah and i think we, we live in a culture today where perfection is all around us it's not real perfection but it's see it on social well, we media. worry don't we we worry what um how we're going to be judged yeah i think yeah and i often worry that, like our team i you know for my team i do worry I mean, I'm, I'll apologise for my own behaviour with my team because I am I'm, I'm pretty annoying sometimes. But I do worry sometimes that they think they have to do it the way I do it, or I'm judgmental that they are doing things differently. And it's like that's what's nice about creativity and innovation is that diverse way of doing stuff. Yeah, and I think there's that balance of wanting to impress. People want to impress because they yeah, but like they do it. You, the, the best way to impress someone is be yourself because you're you can't naturally be someone else you can't copy someone else it's just not natural yeah absolutely and i mean one of the things if you think about lying and uh if you talk about police one of one of the sure um giveaways or tells of someone who's lying is the fact that if you are lying emotionally you cannot keep that lie up to such an intensity mm. for over a long period of time so if you are being honest it's a real emotion there. So you are, it may, you know, you are passionate and you, there's real emotion under what you're feeling. If you're pretending, it's actually quite exhausting to do that pretended emotion. Yeah. And it's a little bit like work. If you're, if you're pretending to be someone, people know this probably, if you are pretending to do something or be someone that you're not quite, it is exhausting. Mm. Yeah, yeah, totally. Absolutely. Yeah. I think I read something the other day that, we retain if we're not authentic if we're not being authentic then that takes up more energy than being authentic yeah so and people say oh how do you put like how can i be like you in presenting and i'm like well one you don't necessarily want to be like me and two it won't be authentic you, you need yeah. to present in your way and i think that comes with time because whenever i see you present particularly if we go to uh, conferences in person i'm always like so you just rock up and just present because that to me that's quite intimidating it's not intimidating is the right word but i one thing that you should never do but sometimes we do lean into you kind of compare yourself to people and you shouldn't so i shouldn't compare myself to you as a presenter because you you've got your academia where you were presenting every day and you're, you're just very adept at rocking it rocking up to a conference somewhere with yeah. Well, it's interesting. So my style is I use lots of pictures and there's two reasons I use a picture. One, it, well, the first reason is I can change what I'm about to say to a picture. So like, there's no script. Hmm. I look, I literally turn around at the screen behind me, Paul, and go, what was I going to say about that? And, and it will come out differently every time I do it, but it, it's a bit of a prompt. And, and it's kind of related to that. It keeps me on the straight and narrow. So those picture prompts, kind of keep me railed in a little bit so that I don't go off too much onto a but other people need much more structure to the but it's what works with for you then you've got to remember you know for that authenticity is to do how it works for you yeah 
yeah absolutely absolutely so i'm conscious of your time i know that you you've got a busy schedule so i've, I've done well to, to to keep you for, for as long as i have done um, <laughs> well so, you know what we're like we can talk forever so uh i know but i, I know. think there's definitely that you know it's unfortunately if you want to change you're gonna to have to be a little bit brave i'm not saying that means you have to scale the himalayas but it's that little pivot just believe in yourself a little bit and just do it a little incrementally and mm. test the waters a little bit but do it in your way don't you know we read books don't we and we compare ourselves and oh they did it that way and we watch videos and go oh i need to do it that way do you though have, you know you won't know until you try and you might go actually that's the worst way that i need to do it um, and what about listening to other people say if you have a knowing say if there's people listening now that are, are in that they're in that cusp of thinking i want to pivot i want to change but then you've got maybe people around you that don't understand because you've been doing something for a period of time and maybe they might even be a little bit jealous of the fact that you're you're finally going to make the change do you have any advice about how they can still be steadfast and move forward and maybe ignore people that other people's doubts yeah again i think the doubt stems from sort of part of jealousy uh, uh part fear because i think people feel that they're going to be left behind possibly mm. um and so what we can't do is be sort of restricted and limited by other people's fears and anxieties and i know that's easy to say but if you think about it if the shoe was turned would they really be bothered about you and be as kind to mm. you know think about your change i bet they would just do it yeah absolutely. and there are ways of doing it where you don't have to tread on people mm. you can actually sometimes you can bring people on the journey with you and go well i'm thinking of doing this or learning this or trying this new technique you're probably going to benefit as well from it it's actually not a threat to you it's something that can actually help you develop yeah so it's that positive spin on things and that i think the awareness of how can you position something where it is not perceived as a threat which is, is obviously more difficult than and, and 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 maybe you don't have to share if you're doing something maybe you don't have to share everything with everybody obviously your partner your, your wife or your, your your girlfriend or your boyfriend whoever that is or, or maybe a close friend but if, but if we've got maybe a group of because i've got i've got a, a lovely friends i'm very lucky as you are some of my friends will maybe if i'm if i'm going to do something a little bit different i maybe know not to have a conversation with them about that because they will over a pint they will be what are you mad what are you do what are you doing so yeah. i probably but that stems from that's basic human inability to take on new things that we are from an evolutionary point of view change actually represents threat because it's like uh i'm putting more resources and i'm putting myself on you know into a target area and we, you know, from an evolution point of view, we like protection, we like safety. So okay. uh, there is a reason why we don't like change, mm -hmm. I think. I'm like you though, you know, I, I play football every week and I think all my football group, I, I get, well, probably half of them don't even know I'm a psychologist. I get no questions really? about, yeah, <laughs> nothing about any of that sort of stuff. Really? So. Yeah. And that's another change because I used to play rugby. So um, I, uh, I've only got into football in the last sort of two, three years. So. Really, really. I've, rugby, I haven't done that for years at school. Oh, it's horrible sport. You get knocked over all the time. So yeah. football, football's a far better. So there are lots of things. And I think bruising, less bruising. it's not, you know, not work. It might be a hobby. It might be a new friend. It might be someone you've been meaning to speak to. Little things where you just put yourself out of your comfort zone a little bit and just try. Mm. And then suddenly you go, oh, that kind of worked. And it just encourages you to do it in other areas. I'm not saying you need to like mm. <laughs> constantly reinvent yourself every day, but there are, you know, you might want to try a new thing. Mm. And it, it'd be remiss of me not to, I've got a couple of questions, but remiss of me not to talk a little bit about psychology and business and how understanding your consumers can really impact the relationship you have with your customers and 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 audience etc maybe you can speak a little bit just briefly around that about if, if there's somebody listening that's i don't know he's got a business or in business and they they're struggling to engage their customers a little bit better how can psychology really impact their ability to really transform that those relationships with their customers and, and engagement yeah so it's not a case of either or it's a i think the psychology is complementary so i think a lot of businesses know to some extent who their audience is and then know what they do 
maybe when they do it i don't think they know why they do stuff okay. or why they don't do stuff yeah absolutely. and I, I guess in, if i really boil it down that's kind of what we bring to the table is we can tell you you why your audience do or don't do things or what you need to do to make them decide or do certain things whether that's onboarding trust subscriptions you know how your website copy and imagery needs to look in terms of engagement and resonance that's what we add so we're not actually taking anything away we work with marketing we work with digital we work with commercial teams in bringing that psychology understanding of why why does the brain need it that way why does the person think that way why do they do that for example yeah so which is which is amazing and just from work just from having worked in companies outside of IB and psychology I'm, I'm acutely aware of when you've got working on a project and we put blood sweat and tears into something but psychology is missed and then in terms of the execution or the implementation has been pretty much around our own biases and we, we kind of missed the mark in terms yeah. of yeah well if you talk to a lot of customers. heads whether they're marketing digital commercial they're probably I mean I've had this you know you go into a kind of group meeting and then you come out and walk down the stairs with one of them walk down the lift and they go yeah it wasn't as impactful as we thought it would be or hoped it would be and we spent a lot of money on that campaign mm -hmm. they work with a lot of agencies who do you know advertising brand work marketing and they probably go mm. <laughs> it didn't do us any harm but it didn't do move the dials too much mm -hmm. and it's because well yeah because you haven't added the, the, enough of the psychology in there to understand what buttons you need to press yeah but the thing the thing around that is that companies will do that over and over again because if you don't if you're not aware of you should well, it's all, and it's also psychology. safe because i've always done it so i'll always do it now yeah you would you will do you will roll out that campaign don't get the engagement you want and then the next campaign comes up okay we need to get maybe maybe that person won't work on this campaign because it didn't or we change the teams up a little bit and we're but you kind of get the same output because psychology hasn't been implemented into the overall yeah, into, I think so. and it's blend, blended into into things. Okay, so Simon, last two questions. So, wh where is the best place for people to contact you? I kind of know the answer, but I'm going to ask you anyway. <laughs> I, I've got to think about if I've got the answer now. So, um, they can find me on LinkedIn. Um, there are a few Simon Moores on there actually. There's a goalkeeper called Simon. Moore. Oh, is there? Yeah, apparently. Um, it's a common name. My mom told me Simon was not a common name. <laughs> Like she Paul. grew up in a nunnery or something because I know at least about 50 Simons but anyway same, same Paul. Um, or they can come to the website uh, we are ib.co okay lovely okay well I've as a guy I've got all your details I will put those on the show notes I'll put your email there as, as well just in case people want to get in contact with you and we we have a final question on the podcast which is if you could invite three inspirational people for dinner and they could be alive or they can be passed who, who would you invite so that's interesting. So I've chosen three, as you, you know, and we spoke that you probably change from week to week. But at the moment, given what we've just talked about, I thought the three I was going to, and one of them is going to be like, oh, of course you'd say that. So I would invite um, Pep Guardiola yeah, along you, because partly, obviously, uh, he's yeah. head of my team, but I just think his ability to change and adapt mm. and what goes on in his mind and the bravery that he takes, and he doesn't always get it right, but he's just constantly thinking about that evolving. I, I, I would be fascinated to talk to him. And then sticking on the football thing, I'd invite Alex Scott along as well, because she is actually like, she is really adapted to her. Mm. You know, she started off yeah. as a sort of striker winger and then she went to a fullback. I didn't know this. I didn't know. And this. then she's played in different cultures. She played in America and she played here. She played for the national team. And now look at her media career and she's not, I wouldn't call her an extrovert, but she somehow just adapted herself to the very she, different media. You know she has. And the thing with, with Alex, when you see her, when you saw that she started her career, her career in media, you can see the elevation. You can see the, the growth. Yeah. You can see the confidence. And, and the reason I say that is because unfortunately for, for women, particularly women of colour, you get people that will have opinions about whether you should. Well, I mean, look at the flag she's got, that, you know, accent, uh, the fact that she's a footballer, yeah. what she's doing on uh, like the one show and that. And it's like, yeah. that's, that's, that's people, that's their own, 
weakness in not accepting change and you know jealousy etc but I think she's very quietly and confidently I mean I would not say she's a you know she's not a vivacious extrovert but she's quietly confidently gone about what she's doing and her change um and got on with it and I kind of admire that in lots yeah, no, of ways she's fantastic. she has been able to do that amazing job and she, you know uh, I think she's providing a gateway to other women and yeah. color and people but maybe don't have the confidence or and they want to change so I think yeah definitely so I would definitely invite her and then the last guest I I'm going to change it tack slightly and I would invite Gary Newman along to um dinner actually so, so uh, is this singer He's a singer, yeah. Okay. He's, okay. Uh, but he's someone, if you look at his career, he has, not only does he change into someone different when he's on stage, because he's mm. very much an introvert. But really? when he's on stage, he, he's very extroverted. So he's a bit of a showman. But his, just his, if you look at his music career and his ability to change and find new things, and it's quite amazing, his story, actually. So I did, but I would be really interesting. You know, he flies and crashes planes and uh, all sorts of things. So he's like, and for someone he emits, he finds like social interaction. So he probably wouldn't come along to dinner because he finds social interaction quite difficult to do. Um, but, you know, I'd be fascinated to uh, sort of chat to him uh, about his take on life and how he's just become so adaptable to it. Maybe we need to send this episode to them to see whether it can happen. You never know. <laughs> what, what, yeah, we're manifesting. I don't know. Yeah, we're trying to cook for all three. You probably wouldn't <laughs> get the same meal either. But anyway, Simon, it's been fabulous to have you as a guest finally. Or, or well, thank you. I really, really enjoyed the conversation. Hopefully, we can do this again and maybe cover a different topic. But uh, thank you for your time today. Uh, thank you very much, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for tuning into this episode of My Perfect Failure. We're always looking to grow the show. So please do share this episode far and wide, particularly if you know people that are looking to navigate change. This will be a great episode for them to listen to and, and really uh, glean some insights from. And your feedback is most welcome. So always keen to hear about things you like and, and equally things you don't like. So you can contact me at paul at myperfectfailure.com or you can contact me via the website. So take care for now. Bye. Thanks for listening to My Perfect Failure podcast. Be sure to visit www.myperfectfailure.com to join the conversation. Subscribe to our podcast on iTunes or Google Play. Look out for our next episode.